Well, everyone, we are in for such a treat to have Rich teaching us today, and I won't say too much except that we're so grateful to have Rich with us, because he is, Rich, are you 40, was it 40 years? A little over. A little over 40 years being a high school teacher, so I think he can handle us. So. <laughs> One of those was the pandemic teaching year, so that counts as five years. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks, Audrey. And here's a here's a quick commercial for Audrey's good work out there in the narthex. You will see this year's Lenten journal or, or, or devotional. Devotional. Yeah. That's right. That's the word I wanted. So make sure you pick up your your copy. It looked like there weren't that many out there. I'm trying to build up some of that. Some of these. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. These are yeah, jumping off the hot. shelves pretty quickly. <laughs> so I'm going to go get it now. But... <laughs> um, I, I, I'm delighted to have a chance to present this morning on the High Holy Day of American Culture. Um, you know, the Super Bowl combines all of the things that make us Americans. It combines what? Commercialism, uh, celebrity, violence, uh, you name it, and, and it's all there. And, uh, and, uh, this was going to be about Lincoln, but I explained to Audrey that because of the day, I thought we were just talking about the 49ers and the Chiefs. <laughs> kind of see what we could see in terms of theology and that. But when when a committee of us that sit down and figure out what we're going to present in Donuts and Theology over the course of, of a spell of time, um, we're trying to come up with something for February the 11th. I thought, well, February the twelfth is, of course, Lincoln's birthday. Lincoln's birthday. We don't, we don't, we're not even that conscious of it anymore because we've neutered it with this kind of awful President's Day thing. But you know, I'm not celebrating Rutherford B. Hayes or or <laughs> what. But um, I thought about that, and and that was one reason why I, I volunteered to do a Lincoln-related um, topic today. But also, there was something that's been dogging me since the autumn that I hope I'll bring in a little later on. I'll, 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 I'll kind of throw that away for a second. The way that we're going to get at what Ronald L. White, a Presbyterian um, scholar, called in a wonderful short book, Lincoln's Greatest Speech, um, the way that we're going to get at this is first to look at some earlier American rhetoric that invokes God, attempts to explain who God is and what God's up to, essentially um, gets into some predictions about what God will be doing um, because of who God is. Um, those two preliminaries that we'll look at before we get to Lincoln um, are gonna jar some of us a little bit um, just because of the fact that it was a different time when these people said what these people said. Um, that second, or that, that, that Lincoln's greatest speech that, that White argued uh, ran against what you think. He's not talking about the Gettysburg Address. He's talking about the second inaugural address, um, which Lincoln gave on March 5th, 1865. And we'll, we'll spend the bulk of our time. <clears throat> but where I'd like to begin is with one American, actually an Anglo-American, because this happened during the colonial period, well before the American Revolution, I'd like to look at one American attempting to explain who he thinks God is and what God intends to do. And for us to do that, we're going to look into this packet. And if you haven't yet picked up a packet, there are some over here. Audrey has some extras. They are numbered line by line in case we want to make references to text that would be easier for us to all find them. And I think what I'm going to do is I will just read it aloud. That way we'll all kind of encounter it front to end together and we won't have to kind of wait for our varying um, reading paces. And let me just contextualize it first. When I was an AP history teacher, I got to the point where I was, uh, you know, insistent that my students, when they looked at a primary source, that we use what I kind of cornily called the big four. And the big four was, who's our author? Who's the author's intended audience? What's the author's purpose that's together? What's the historical context and what's the point of view of the author? This is Jonathan Edwards, the Reverend Jonathan Edwards, Yale educated, the son and grandson of Puritan ministers and himself a prominent minister. 
He is speaking to a, to a congregation in Enfield, Connecticut in 1741. We're into a major religious event in American history called the Great Awakening. And the Great Awakening is a period of intense religious fervor, revivalism, a return to sort of a, an older, more passionate religion, the, the, the kind of getting away from a really intellectualized kind of, kind of um, um, I don't know, lacking in fervor approach. At the center of the Great Awakening was the understanding that you were not really saved unless you had been through a two-stage process. Conviction, which meant you were convinced, absolutely certain of your sinfulness and the fact that you were, you were bound for hell, followed by conversion, the notion that a loving God had decided to let you off of us. And um, Great Awakening congregations, some of which may have been out in the fields someplace because some of the Great Awakening pastors didn't have their own churches. They were itinerants. Oftentimes, were reduced to tears and, and <laughs> screaming and yelling and renting their clothing and things like that because of the power of the messages of some of those Great Awakening ministers. The second most famous of whom, and maybe the most famous of whom, was Jonathan Edwards. And here's what Edwards says to a congregation in Enfield, Connecticut on the 8th of July, 1741. This is only two paragraphs from a much longer sermon. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He has a purer eyes than can bear to you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince, and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell the last night, that you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. And there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in this house of God, provoking his pure eyes for your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop down in town. This is real sort of an Audrey Weber kind of thing. <laughs> I'll continue if, if you can take it. Oh, sinner. Consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and to burn it asunder. And you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself, nothing to keep off the flames of wrath, nothing of your own, nothing that you have ever done, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. <laughs> I don't know if they had a coffee hour, you know, in that particular service, but um, that's Edward's most famous sermon. And it is still studied in, in English classes. Um, you know, I, I know my own students used to, used to, used to study it over in uh, Mrs. Goujon's class. But I think what I'd like to do, because our, our primary, I mean, it'd be interesting someday to do a whole thing on the Great Awakening, but the Great Awakening is not where we're going to spend most of our time. How valid do you find his assertions about who God is and what God plans? Well, I guess at that time he's instilling fear in the congregation and saying that if you don't live a pure life and, and we all don't live a pure life every minute that you're bound to go to hell. However, <laughs> if in some part in the day 
you really believe that, you know, I, I should be good, then you'll be safe. Well, Thanks, I man. think if I were infinite and all-knowing, I could have that this view toward the rest, the rest of you. <laughs> you know, it seems to me be, there, there's a lot of how it follows from mm -hmm. the sense of an infinite all-knowing God that being rather disgusted with the people who can't be Thanks, Mickey. Thanks, David. Wendy? <clears throat> It sounds like you can't escape the original sin. And he doesn't. I wonder, it seems to me like he doesn't see God as a loving God. You know, we're, we're lucky that he <clears throat> acknowledges us. And we have taken two paragraphs, two especially provocative paragraphs, on the conviction side of this thing. And, you know, the message couldn't be that and that only, but certainly this segment of this message is about a God of judgment, an angry God, as the title says, um, who, who seems mostly about punishing people for their transgressions. I, I think also, though, most of these people were not intellectuals. They were the average person. So therefore, if you're going to instill fear in somebody, there's no better way than to say you're going to go to hell. <laughs> and it's very true that this caught on among the mostly um, uneducated. I mean, most New Englanders were literate because you had to be literate to read the Bible. And they're, they're Calvinists and they believe in scripture. But you're right, David. I mean, you know... Uh, the, the support for the Great Awakening tends to come from the bottom up, and it tends to challenge the elites who had been trained at Harvard and Yale and others. He's an elite, but somehow he manages to connect to large numbers of people who, who, who don't have much. Um, right. It, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, I counted nine references to hell or the fires of hell just in the first paragraph alone. And, you know, there's, there's, there's his message, you know, that, that your future is a very bleak one unless there's something like this experience of conviction and conversion in your life. Um, it's, you know, the passages we've isolated are in no ways about a loving God, but about a judgmental God, in no ways about a God of mercy, but about a God of punishment. And, you know, for us sitting here in 2024, it doesn't look like the kind of message that would bring us back to church next Sunday. <laughs> it's just not about where most of us are. Um, you know, Rich. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, in some ways, it's very political as well. You mentioned yeah. Calvinism, the elite. <clears throat> so Calvinism, predestination, the elect, the and right. the have-nots. Yeah. So the have said, I like this stuff because I'm I'm chosen. Yeah. And then to your point, <clears throat> the poor farmers, the uneducated, they are already the have nots. And they felt like it, like they were damned, but there was a ray of hope that you could be saved. There, there's a school of thought that says that this is this is in some ways an, an early tremor in the challenge to the deferential hierarchical social order of the colonies, which is going to play out big time politically in 1776, with a challenge to the ultimate head of that hierarchical deferential social order, the British monarch. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if anybody's, you know, ever really firmly proved that, but there are a lot of scholars that say, this is important in terms of that challenge and where it would eventually lead um, the country. There's a, there's a wonderful passage from a, a simple farmer named Nathan Cole, and he talks about going to hear George Whitfield, the other greatest of the, of the, the, the new light, great awakeners. And he, he says, when I heard him, you know, my foundation was broken up and, and I, I realized I could not save myself. And, you know, it, it translates, it works. So that's 1740, that's in the middle of the great awakening. Let's turn a page and let's go 36 years forward. Now, so one very big thing has happened in that 36, period, 36 years, and that is we have broken free of Great Britain in the American Revolution. We're going to go to Philadelphia, and we're going to go to the Constitutional Convention. 
where they're writing the new constitution. Now, I've got to tell you something. We're not supposed to know what's there because the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, who were seated kind of like we are right now, one of the first things they agreed to was that this stuff was so explosive that they didn't want the general public to know what was going on behind the shuttered windows and the locked door at Independence Hall, and that no one should ever know what was said. And when James Madison early and things sitting about where Kathy Jo is, um, was seen scribbling notes, somebody said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute what are you doing? We're, we're, nobody's supposed to, to have any record of what we're saying here. We're just going to turn out a new constitution. And Madison somehow said, well, you know, we should have some kind of a record. Eventually, Madison's notes were released um, many, many years up the line. And these are Madison's notes on a segment of the debates in uh, the Constitutional Convention, which ran from May till September of 1787 in a very hot uh, room down in Philadelphia. At this point, they've turned to the question of the Atlantic slave trade and, and the, the importation of Africans from mostly West Africa to the United States. And the question is, should our new constitution permit it or should our new constitution prohibit it? And the, the, this is Madison writing about what he hears. And the speaker is Colonel George Mason, a fellow Virginian um, who would eventually not support ratification of the constitution, largely because it lacked a bill of rights but I think some other concerns about too powerful a central government. Here's what Mason says. This is Madison characterizing Mason. Colonel Mason, this infernal traffic originated in the avarice of British merchants. The British government constantly checked the attempts of Virginia to put a stop to it. Stop to what? Stop to the Atlantic slave trade. The present question concerns not the importing states alone, but the whole union. The evil of having slaves was experienced during the late war. Had slaves been treated as they might have by the enemy, they would have proved dangerous instruments in their hands. Maryland and Virginia, he said, had already prohibited the importation of slaves expressly. North Carolina had done the same in substance. All this would be in vain if South Carolina and Georgia be at liberty to import. Now, I will tell you that the South Carolina and Georgia delegates to the convention were going to drive a very hard bargain to keep the Atlantic slave trade open. The Western people, by which he really means people in places like what would become Kentucky and Tennessee, the Western people are already calling out for slaves for their new lands and will fill that country with slaves if they can be got through South Carolina and Georgia. Slavery discourages arts and manufacturers. The poor despise labor when performed by slaves. They prevent the emigration of whites who really enrich and strengthen a country. They produce the most pernicious effect on manners. Every master of slaves is a born tyrant. They bring the judgment of heaven on a country. As nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, they must be in this. By an inevitable chain of causes and effects, providence punishes national sins by national calamities. He lamented that some of our Eastern, that means New England brethren, had from a lust of gain embarked in this nefarious traffic. As to the states being in possession of the right to import, this was the case with many other rights now to be properly given up. He held it essential in every point of view that the general government should have power to prevent the increase of slavery. Now, I've got to tell you one other contextual point. You know, he's talking to a bunch of politicians from 12 other states, Rhode Island didn't send a delegation, and he's trying to persuade them to bar the Atlantic slave trade right here. You know, they haven't decided what they're gonna do. But I, of course, as is always the case with these Virginians, Jefferson and the rest of them, he himself is a big slave mm -hmm. You know, So uh, that's not our topic here today, but it's just a, a historical point that needs to be made. Well, I wanna take you, go ahead. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna take you to a given spot. From what I've read uh, about the revolutionary time, even up to, uh, up to the Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, Virginians, North Carolinians, Maryland's people were not opposed to the slave trade. They wanted slaves desperately and uh, fought for the fact that they needed slaves to even make a meager profit. 
the the dynamic by that time is they're starting to think <laughs> we we can we can replenish our supply of slaves just by the natural birthing of slave children we may have more than we need here so what we'd like to be able to do is to sell our surplus slaves to the places that need lots more, the South Carolinas, the Georgias, and these new Western regions that will probably at one time or another become states. Virginia and Maryland, I think North Carolina by this time had barred the slave trade into their own ports. So in other words, they halted the practice, but I think that the, the, the thing that most historians would tell you is they're trying to play a supply demand game here. And they're figuring that there's there's a lot of money to be made by selling Virginia and Maryland slaves further south. And of course, this would go on all the way up until the outbreak of the Civil but War. Doesn't this early text address states versus government? Sure. I mean, there's I mean, a, like today. Yeah, there's a, the same problem. There's a lot of discussion about federalism, what yeah. we call federalism. They didn't use the word in those days. Um, in the debates, in the in the uh, in the Constitutional Convention. I'd like us to go to lines 13, 14, 15, 16. <laughs> I think that's where our topic places us today. So who is God and what can we predict God's going to do, at least if we listen to George Mason here? Kathy Jack? Yeah, I highlighted all of those. I mean, I think you see it in today's national discourse as well, especially the point about um you know, bringing the judgment of God on a country and that you are punished by national calamities as a nation. His reasoning owes something to Jonathan Edwards, doesn't it? I mean, where's the connection point between Mason and Edwards? They're both the elite. Okay. Yeah, they're both uh, the elite. Judgment, that's holding us over. God does punish individuals, right? Yeah for our sins. In that respect, Mason buys that, but Mason says, but he can't do that. God can't do that for the whole United States of America. He can't, I guess he could send us all to hell, but, but he, he's, that's not how he works, says Mason. You know, who's a lawyer and a politician, he's not a theologian, but, but he says, since God's not gonna ship us all to hell because we're a slave holding republic, he's got another plan for us, and that is collective punishment. Look at what he says. Mm -hmm. By an inevitable change, you know, nations can't be rewarded or punished in the next world, can't send the whole nation to hell. They must be in this. We're going to be punished here in this world before we're out of here by an inevitable chain of causes and effects. Providence punishes national sins by national calamities. I mean, you see it carried down to the regional, right? Where there were a number of people early on in COVID that blamed the New York and New Jersey area for things that they did not agree with and the same as I left. Were those people who were who were doing that? And I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask ask, ask you <laughs> since you've raised it. Were those people grounding that in theology? Yes. And and what was the theology? Being judged for the sins of the uh, of the of the metropolitan, right, area. metropolitan yeah. area. When the AIDS crisis yeah, first sure. broke, many of us remember religious voices, yeah. many of them from outside our area, but some probably from inside, said, well, it's a judgment, yeah. you know, on those people. Yeah. Um, but even then, he's talking about the whole nation, Mason is. And, you know, if nobody's ever going to make a movie of the Constitutional Convention, um, <laughs> thank God, but, but if they did make a movie, of the debates in the Constitutional Convention. And, and Mason says those words, every master of slaves is born a petty tyrant. They bring the judgment of heaven on a country as nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world. They must be in this by an inevitable chain of causes and effects. Providence punishes national sins by national calamities. And when Mason says that in our movie, 
about the Constitutional <laughs> Convention, the, the music goes, <laughs> and what do we, when we look at those lines, what do we all think that causes us to say, you know, in some ways Mason was right. Mm -hmm. What do we inevitably think of? What's the national calamity Civil War. that, yeah, that Providence, God punishes, you know, us for, yes, yeah, it's, it's the Civil War. Isn't Mason in effect predicting, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen and I don't know what form it's going to take, but we're going to pay for this. And what we all know sitting here in 2024 is we sure as heck did pay for it starting in 1861. Well, Lincoln said so in your document C. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> John's right. And that's where we're going to go in Wait, just a minute. But we've actually got a couple minutes still. Yeah, if anybody well, wants to start about it. There has not been a movie about the, this convention. In Adams, when they did the, the miniseries, yeah. they did cover this debate. However, not about God, Adams <laughs> wasn't, wasn't at the Constitutional Convention. He, I wonder if it was actually in the in the in a Continental Congress debating independence. It was Continental. I'm sorry, it was Continental Congress. There's a big debate. scene in 1776, and it's a it's a showstopper kind of a number called molasses and tobacco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 right. Molasses. And you know. Uh, my family and I went to see the recent yes. revival of 1776, which was an all-female and non-binary cast. And I'll tell you, the, the the performer that sang that song, boy, she knocked our socks off. I mean, you know, it's a pretty powerful, powerful scene. So, you know, this question of, of slavery, slave trade, it's all over the place back in those days. And, and you know, I mean, not to not to turn this into Constitution 101, but you know, the, the US Constitution did protect slavery in three ways. It kept the Atlantic slave trade going until 1808, when Congress had the power, if it wished to exercise that power, to ban the Atlantic slave trade. It did. Thomas Jefferson, you know, in his basically State of the Union address, <laughs> called for it and signed into law a ban. The Constitution also, the Three-Fifths Compromise, essentially protected the existence of slavery by counting three-fifths of all of the non-white people in each state and figuring out its representation in the House of Representatives and thus its power in the Electoral College. And um, thirdly, the Fugitive Slave Clause, you know, which said that a, that a slave getting to a state that doesn't have slavery is not free, they, 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 they must be returned to their master. So, you know, the Constitution's tricky on this one. Okay, great. Yeah, go ahead, Wendy. Um, I recently became aware of Lincoln's speech in 1838 that he gave at the Lyceum Address. The Lyceum Address. Right. It's a wonderful thing to take a look at. He was only a relative right. he was kid in those days. Right. He was a right. into you know, politics. But it reminds me very much of the section here where he foresees, because of slavery, that you know you either get rid of it or you're going to come to blows. And I, I tried to make a, a, to print it up, and I wasn't able to do it yet. But um, it's worth reading. I mean, it's amazing how when you think, you know, listening to his mind and his writing is beautiful. I, I first encountered it in graduate school, and yeah. I'd never heard of it before. Right. And, you know, he says, you know, if, if we are to perish as a nation of free men, um, it must be by suicide. Yes. You know, in, yes. in effect, if, if we stop being a free country, it's not because somebody yes. invades us. He says, you know, not even a Napoleon could, could leave a footprint on a Blue Ridge or take a drink from the Mississippi. You know, we'll, we'll never be invaded like that. But we could lose our country because we fumble it away. Yeah. And, and to me, that talks about what's happening right now. I know. Yeah. Wow. How, how little changes. Yeah. You know, it's uh, history repeating itself. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's a good speech to look at. The hard part with all of the Lincoln speeches, especially the longer ones, is you know isolating you know where you really want to be. But but it's it, yeah, it's well worth look. The Lyceum Address of eighteen thirty eight. Yep. Okay. So now it's on. John's John kind of kind of set us up to make sure that we get there. And you know, as I was planning this, I was thinking, don't spend too much time on Edwards. Don't spend too much time on Mason. Lincoln is our focus. So I appreciate the the 
a prompt there. We're going to look at much of document C, but not all of it, at least not yet. This is Abraham Lincoln on March 4th, 1865. The Civil War began in April of 61. Lincoln ran for re-election in 64, and over the course of the summer, he was quite certain he was going to lose. And a lot of Republicans around him were saying, you're going to lose. And the only way you're going to save yourself is to offer negotiations to the Confederates. And everybody realized that the cost of negotiating with the Confederates was going to be to drop the Emancipation Proclamation, reverse that, you know, kind of shut that down. And then Lincoln might get reelected. In the end, Lincoln considered it and thought, nope. And he says to a couple of Wisconsin politicians that come to visit him, not long after he's kind of made that internal decision, I should be damned in hell and eternity if I were to turn my back on the black soldiers who are right now fighting for our nation. And in the end, he does the right thing and manages to get reelected. William Tecumseh Sherman helps him by taking Atlanta. And now he's being inaugurated for his second term. It's March. He doesn't know, nobody knows, but we know that the war will end by middle April. So it's close, things, things are starting to look good, but it's not over yet. And it's with that in mind, as he stands there on that, uh, on that platform at the US Capitol on March 4th, 1865, that he gives the shortest inaugural address, I believe in American history, Roosevelt's in, in 45 might've been even shorter, but I'm not even sure about that. And as I say, um, Ronald White, respected uh, uh, authority, says this is Lincoln's greatest speech. No matter how great Gettysburg is, this is even greater. Here's what he says. One eighth of the whole, he's, he's dating back to 1860. One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the Southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. And a few weeks back, we went through one of our perpetual recurring discussions about was slavery the cause of the Civil War? Well, here's Lincoln saying, yes, slavery was the cause of this war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible, and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not, that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered, that of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in the living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth filed by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord 
are true and righteous all together. Okay. Now we've looked at Edwards and we've looked at Mason and now it's time to look at Lincoln. There are two assertions that I'm just going to steer us to take a look at. And the first one that we're going to look at actually happened second to this. That first one is how, how valid, how plausible, how acceptable do you find the president saying to us, we've committed a significant sin here over centuries. And God has decided that he's giving us this terrible war as the woe due to us for that sin. Of course, that war would cost about 720,000 American lives and bring great suffering to homes all over the land. So I guess what I want to ask is, what do you think of Lincoln's theology there? Well, I think in some ways he's saying that the North and the South read the Bible. So they're they're equal from that standpoint, mm -hmm. from God's eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of, I guess, uh, who he's going to give aid to. Well, why doesn't he, give, <laughs> why, why doesn't he punish the Southerners? <laughs> and just then. <laughs> well, one answer to it is notice that he doesn't call it Southern slavery in line 16. American, American slavery. And why is it American slavery? <clears throat> well, I mean, we had slaveholders who were the founders of this church. There was slavery in New Jersey, and there was slavery in Massachusetts, and there was slavery in Pennsylvania. Now, it had been gotten rid of by the time of the Civil War. But let's also remember, who's owning a lot of those ships that are bringing those slaves that George Mason wants to, to, to cut off. They're New Englanders in a lot of cases. They're Northeasterners. So Lincoln says, just because not all of us are Southerners, not all of us are slaveholders, we're not off the hook. There's a collective guilt here in that we permitted it. We, we, we looked the other way. We didn't do enough to get rid of it. <laughs> right, right. The, the textile mills of Lowell, Massachusetts, you know, thrived because of that. Oh. Wasn't slavery the, it, the reason for the split of the two churches here? I've always heard that a difference on the question of abolitionism, mm -hmm. you know, and how hard we ought to be pushing from our faith to opposing slavery had something to do with that split. I don't know, not an authority on the on the on our church history, but I've always kind of been led to believe that that. Some more about evangelism. Mm -hmm. about well, you're in the second Great Awakening, right there. Um, and it was the way we go out and cross the ties. And an interesting thing about the Second Great Awakening is that it led a lot of people into it, like abolitionism and women's rights and free public education and things like that. Go ahead, Brian. Um, just a thought. Do hey, we focus, uh, and rightly, a lot on slavery? But what about segregation? Because segregation, even until the mid 20th century, it gets at the attitudinal aspect. Okay, that's what God looks at too, not just, you know, physically do you or do you not own or promote slavery, but like, where's your heart at? Right. Do you walk humbly, do justice? Um, and that's where I think the North, of course, could, could really get hammered. Sure, sure. And, you know, I mean, de facto segregation, which still exists, mm -hmm. um, you know, segregation that isn't codified by law, but exists. I mean, you know, I taught 43 years in a, a nice suburban school, and I taught some black students, but I didn't teach many. If if I if my career had been at Malcolm X in Newark, I suspect it would have been a very different dynamic. And how is that that happens? Well, it's some kind of segregation about black people tending to live in one place and white people or or non-black people living in other places. And there, there's a lot of segregation among the small free black populations of the North. 
during this time. And if you ever take a look at what happens in New York City just a few days after the Battle of Gettysburg, um, when the New York City draft riots break out, I mean, it, it's it's like a pogrom, you know, against Black people. Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, so it's important that we understand that Lincoln was a man of his time. And while uh, slavery was a big issue, uh, he believed that Blacks and whites were not equal. That's true. As a matter of fact, he thought, well, what happens after the Civil War is over? Mm -hmm. and we free the Blacks? Now what? Right. And he was in favor of shipping Blacks over to Liberia so that there would be no problem. And he, that ethic right. continues to exist even up till today. He had dropped colonization by, by, mm -hmm. by midway through the Civil War, but really all the way up to um, late 1862, He's interested in gradual, compensated, voluntary emancipation, mostly by the border states, the Maryland's and the Kentucky's, with the inducement, not the requirement of, I wouldn't call it deportation, but, but you know, trying to induce Blacks to look at other places to live, because he was not convinced at all that Blacks and whites could live in this nation. On an equal basis, when he runs against Douglas in '58 for the Senate seat that he that he does not win, he says, "You know, don't anybody misunderstand me. I'm not advocating the social or political equality of blacks and whites. He was advocating their economic equality and the right of black people, as much as anybody else, to eat the bread that they have earned through their own labor. So he's a complex character." But what about his theology? You know, which says the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Uh, could could you or I, as a believer, and that's an interesting question regarding Lincoln too that we're not going to open. <laughs> could you or I, as believers in the living God, not see the Civil War as God's punishment to all of us? For slavery, I guess what I'm asking is, and I, I could never really get into this as a as a classroom teacher in a public school, right? okay. but is that how you understand God? And if and if if it is, then do you routinely attribute the bad things that happen to our country to God punishing us for something that we had done? Or if you reject Lincoln's theology here, why do you reject it? So I think that's my question to you is, do you, do you buy this line of analysis that attempts to explain the, the most violent event in American history, by far the bloodiest war we ever fought, that brought terrific suffering to so many Americans, do you buy his argument that, you know, I mean, we're not enjoying this, we don't like it at all, we, we, we'd love for it to be over right now, but it's a just God giving us what we deserve. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's God choosing to do this. If he says, if this thing had, like, it looks like it may be nearing an end. You know, the Union armies are starting to close, close the, the circle. But if it continues until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn from the back of a slave is drawn by another with a sword, as it was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. I think that's a northern view. I think uh, in the south, uh, my, my mom's family from the south, they didn't think slavery was necessarily bad, and they didn't think they would be punished because... The blacks were not equal, so they they were where they should be. So God wasn't going to punish you for putting down the blacks because that's that was their life. Well, it was a it was a it was a convenient way to look at it, you know. If you were if you were a slaveholder, if you were benefiting from this, but once again, um, do you agree with that explanation? of what happened from 61 to 65 and resulted in 720,000 Americans dying that God ordained it because he was, because God was so revolted, 
to use Jonathan Edwards' term, so angry with us collectively for the sin of American slavery. Remember, it's not Southern slavery, it's American slavery. The, I, I get, this is my question is, do you, do you buy that line of reasoning? It suggests to me the same question, are we masters on our own fate? You know, is that an audacious thing to, to think that we're in control of our lives and God is not? Mm -hmm. um, and look at that as a nation as well. Yeah. Um, I, sometimes I like to think that things that happen are because I made them happen yeah. or God has allowed them to happen. Um, I, you know, do we believe that this is an angry God or a righteous God or a loving God? And the interesting thing I think is Lincoln, who we tend to look at as a, a kind of an avuncular and humane and kind-hearted person, and I think he was those things, the theology here owes a fair amount to Jonathan Edwards. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Lincoln's people, at least on, on his father's side, came in the Puritan Great Migration. You know, they, 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 were, they were Puritans who came in through New England, and eventually the family migrates all the way out west over generations. But I, I don't see that much difference between what Edwards is saying about people on a personal level and what Mason's saying about our nation and what it should expect and what Lincoln's saying to explain what, what is happening to us here and has happened over the last four years. And I guess my question is, do you buy it? I think the fact that God didn't step in to do anything about stopping the horrendous sacrifices of people who were going to suffer makes you think that he was okay with it. Let's keep going with this horrible thing. That that's the only way I can get this thought through your head that this is wrong. It's interesting you say that. Lincoln wrote a letter in response to a letter from a Kentucky lawyer named Hodge, Albert Hodge, in which he says, God could have stopped this thing any day if God wanted to. Yet he wills that it continue. And, he, and we see that here. Yet if he wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years, you know, and, and every drop of blood, if God wills that it continue, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. We can't do anything about it. We just kind of have to continue to endure it. <laughs> it's a tough theology. Yeah. Huh? yeah. <laughs> oh, teaching this at the University of Glasgow. I, oh, I'm in the heart of faith section. <laughs> <We're not, laughs> but it is so hard. And it's, you know, you can go back and forth of being, well, you know, we are given free will. We can do whatever we want. But then we're like, on this side, like, well, but God is in everything and in every you know a part of our lives so which side is it you know and this oh yeah yeah i mean look I, I, i'm unanimous consent we all think slavery was a horrendous awful thing and we're all ashamed that our country sustained it as long as we did the interesting question is i i think since god agrees with us on that one did did god decide to punish the people of the United States in that really rough way, you know, to get us to stop. Mm -hmm. Right, and then when? Yeah, I know we're almost out of time. Maybe not so much did, did or didn't God punish. I'm sorry, I was just checking with Audrey on time. Yeah. Could not, you say it again? Not right? so much whether did God or did God not punish us, but the principle of sowing and reaping. Some people call it karma. Some people say what goes around comes around. We all label it differently, but the Bible does teach us mm -hmm. that our actions have consequences and results we, that we are responsible for. So that's yeah. all I'm saying is. And you know, I find that what was, what was sown yeah. and then what was produced. <laughs> And yet, they're, they're, that's qualitatively different, in my mind at least, from God saying, okay, here's what I'm going to do to them. You know, that our actions do have consequences. 
and maybe there's maybe there's a divine you know presence that moves things that way but i think lincoln is going beyond karma or or you know some such thing we're going to go to wendy with the final comment on this and then i want to just take a look at one other little part here you probably remember the quote better than i didn't lincoln say something like if i didn't free any slaves or if yes. i had to free all this you know in a letter to Horace Greeley, yeah. in the summer of 1862, he says, I'm about saving the Union. If I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do that. If I could save the Union by freeing none of the slaves, I would do that. Mm -hmm. And if I could save the Union by freeing some and leaving others in slavery, mm -hmm. I would do that. What I do about slavery, and I think he said the colored race, I do because it helps me save the Union. Now, when he wrote that letter, he had here, a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation ready to go. So he'd already decided he was going to free some and leave others in slavery because the Emancipation Proclamation only freed slaves in areas that were still in rebellion. And that had a lot to do with his, his constitutional powers. He could do that, he thought, as commander-in-chief of the armed forces to help the American forces, the Union forces win the war. But he didn't have as far as he could tell, any power in the office of the presidency to take people's property. And that's legally the status that they have. It's not nice and we don't like it, but he, he felt like he was limited as to what he could do. I think he was also concerned about possibly driving those border states mm -hmm. out of the union if he acted too aggressively. But I think he did do that indirectly. Well, and eventually he endorses when, strongly when, the 13th Amendment. Which, yeah, when he yeah. invaded the South, mm -hmm. of course, God will that the South would lose, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> punish them. If you look at it from that perspective, then then I guess there was a just God, right? Yeah. And that he, he uh, well, I, the people I, yeah. who endorsed slavery. I'm sure glad that the side that won that war won that war. Right. And my own sense is <laughs> God probably was happy about that too. Harsha? Sorry. <laughs> the Indians and it's not so much as Spanish, perhaps, as the Mexicans, but if we wanted to bring in American history, especially in the period leading up to and then after the Civil War, I think you've got you've had equally troubling issues mm -hmm. regarding the people of Mexico, whom we invade in 1846, and really from 1607 at Jamestown all the way up to, you know, well, I was going to say wounded knee, but beyond with the, the formation of schools to essentially take the Indian out of Indian children. We, we've had a, a really tough history there, which is too big for us to go into here, but I'm glad you mentioned it because it's a, it's a good reminder to us. I want to just take a look at line 14. There's a short sentence there in an inaugural address that has lots of long sentences. And I think it was this sentence that caused me that day when we were trying to figure out what to do to um, say, you know, I would kind of like to do something with the second inaugural address. And that is, as a, you know, sort of the way into all of this is the Almighty has his own purposes. And I'm not even that interested in taking on the notion that the Almighty has his own purposes. I'm interested in the term almighty. And the, this sentence came to mind in October when I read about the attacks in the portions of Israel that border Gaza. And when we all read and have read about the details of those attacks. I thought, I believe in God. I absolutely believe in God. I, I'm uncomfortable with the term the Almighty. And then in the weeks afterwards, the, the wider war, which has cost 27,000, you know, it, it certainly didn't make me any more convinced that, oh, maybe the Almighty does work. And I'm not even sure we've, we've got very limited time here. I'm not even sure if, if it's, you know, the, the stuff of, of discussion, but I kind of throw it out there for us all to think about 
<laughs> at Safe and Space the other night, there was a station where there were a lot of different ways to address God. I don't know if you saw that. One of them was the Almighty, and I looked at it with interest because I knew we would we would you know at least touch this here. But we spend all of us spend time thinking about you know if there is a God, why does this happen over here? And it, it's a tough one for us, and we we work through it all in our own ways. But that phrase, and I, and I I love Lincoln. I I love this this speech. But the notion of God as the Almighty, for me personally, <laughs> took a real dent in the autumn of 2023. And I'm, I'm still struggling with it. I, I think it's a term I find harder and harder to personally use. And it's not one that most of us use on a regular basis, I, I think, anyway. So given the fact that we're just about out of time, I think it's just going to be one person's reaction to the use of that word. But on our way out, because we've dealt with fire and brimstone and, you know, war and all that, <laughs> let's, let's follow up. Let's just do one last thing. If we go all the way on document C down to, you know, where he says the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, he said, look, we've committed this great national sin and we're paying for it right now and we may pay for it for a long time. Well, let's give Lincoln some credit for not leaving it there. In effect, we've gone into the, to the confession box in this. And now it's time for us to, to do a Hail Mary <laughs> or whatever. Not part of our tradition for most of us, but I get it. Could you turn to the last page of the packet? You'll recognize this, I think. Some of you may even know it by heart, but I think it'd be a great way for us to end this session. I'd like us all to read it out loud together. <laughs> all right. So, ready? A one, <laughs> a three. With malice toward God, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the others. But I strive to finish the work we are in, to find up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow, and his Lord, to do all his made a duty wherever. Thanks for being here today. I guess we should say amen after that. Thank you. Thank you. Rich, you are fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much for this. This was the perfect in-between path between our two series. And we just so appreciate you and sharing your gifts. And I wish we could have you teaching every week. But I know you're retired from that thing. Anyway, no, I'd be good. Thank you. Uh, next week, we start our, our Lenten series. We're going to be focusing on the same theme, which our sermon series, as well as our Lenten devotionalism, which is on conversations. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different activities planned for that, so you'll be in for a treat with that as well. But thank you for being here. We'll head on over to worship. Thank you for sharing.